Welcome, everybody, to this uh, episode of Beyond the Crucible. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show and the communications director for Crucible Leadership. And you have clicked play on, uh, we hope uh, that you've clicked subscribe to, a podcast that deals in what we call crucible experiences. Those are those moments that we all know probably a little too well, those painful times in our lives, those traumas, tragedies, setbacks, and failures, those things that happen to us or that we have a hand in making happen that can knock the wind out of our sails, that can feel like they, and in fact, in many cases do, change the trajectory of our lives. But here's the good news. We talk about them here on Beyond the Crucible, not to wallow in them, not to just swap war stories for the sake of swapping war stories. We talk about them to help you and to help us get beyond them, to learn the lessons of our crucibles and then move on beyond them, as the the show is titled, so that we can begin to pursue our passions and pursue a life of significance. And our guest today in that, uh, in that pursuit on that journey is a very inspiring one, Warwick. So I, am, uh, I will bring in Warwick, of course, is Warwick Fairfax, the founder of Crucible Leadership, the host of the show. Um, I sometimes call him the captain of the ship or the Lego master of what we do here. So Warwick, mm-hmm. uh, we've got a, 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 a fine guest today, and I think we're going to have a fine conversation. Absolutely, Gary. Really looking forward to it. Um... And that fine guest is Marvin Charles. Marvin has emerged as a community and national leader in creating stronger fathers and healthier families. Because of his own powerful story of separation from and then reunification with his own family, parents, and children, and his 15 plus years of helping others reclaim the positive role of fathers to their families, he is an experienced and trusted mentor and advisor. He's traveled all over the U.S. to speak about empowering fathers, to learn from other national leaders, and to share our successes with other organizations hoping to implement fatherhood programs. Marvin Charles is an ordained minister, and his extraordinary effectiveness comes from his ability to see through the pain and threats of those he counsels to the powerful change possible by embracing a living God and a larger purpose. Neither class nor ethnicity poses an obstacle to him being heard. And by that, Marvin, I know that you mean not you being heard per se, but that living God that you spoke of being heard. Amen. Amen. Well, um, thank you uh, both for um, inviting me to an opportunity to um, share in the gospel. Amen. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, there's nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing that I can do or have done if it just was not possible for um, the Lord in my life. Uh, I know because I tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> so um, I, am, I am honored to be with you today. Uh, like-minded folks, uh, and to share uh, not only my story, but to learn a little bit more about the crucible, right? (laughs) So thank you for this opportunity to do so. Well, Marvin, thank you for being here. I love uh, what your organization does, Divine Alternatives for Dad Services, and I love what Gary just read about... um, what was it? Embracing a living God for a larger purpose. Yes, that's that, exactly it. Yep. Boy, yep. that is that is that is powerful. Um, so, Marvin, I'd, uh, before we get into dads and what you do, I'd love to hear a bit about you. And uh, you're in the Seattle area. I understand? I'd love to hear a bit about your background, growing up, early memories. Kind of set the scene of who is Marvin Charles and. How do you grow up and yeah, a little about your family story? I, I'd, I'd be glad and honored to do that um, work. I, um, I'm born and raised in Seattle. Um, 
I had what was called, I don't know if you, you remember the program, Leave It to Beaver, right? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, yeah. that was my family. It was, it was um, the urban perspective of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, guess, I guess later on it became the Cosby, but trust me, all I knew was Leave It to Beaver. And, uh, and I had a, a sister, uh, Marion, and I, we were, uh, we had a mother and father in our home and, um, um, it was, we, we, uh, my mom prepared lunch for us. We walked to school together with, you know, when things were much more sensible during that time, it was the early sixties. And then, um, one day we came home from school and my mother was on the couch and she was on the couch for a couple of days. And then they rushed her off to the hospital mm. and we never seen her again. Well, she passed away. I remember I was nine years old. My sister was seven. And my aunt and uncle came over. Uh, my father was there. Uh, he was a guy who spent a lot of time working, you know, and so he, she took care of the home and the children and he worked and provided the resources that it took. But when this part of our life was stopped, um, I, we went to, we, we had to move to live with our aunt and uncle and, and this was the aunt and uncle that, you know, you didn't really, uh, you had to dress up to go over to the house. They had plastic on their furniture. It's the one you, you <laughs> really? really didn't want, you really didn't want to go there. But it, so now we were living there. And oh, uh, uh, I remember my, the first thing my uncle told me was, um, that wasn't your mother. That's not your father. You guys belong to the state, but we're going to take care of you. And I was nine years old, and if I, if I didn't know anything else, I knew that at nine years old, that's not what you tell a nine-year-old. I mean, what, 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 is, what is, when you heard that, you're nine, and they're saying, well, your aunt and uncle, but you belong to the state. I mean, emotionally, what, what, did, what were you hearing from them? Well, you know what? Um, mind you, our mother had just passed away. I was still, I couldn't get past that aspect of it. I remember running out the house and going next door and my cousin coming to get me his son. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, and, and it was what I knew that I was in for. So I couldn't even wrap my heads around what he said or what was taking place. It's what's getting ready to happen next. And I stayed in that mind frame for six years. We went to move with my aunt and uncle. The first, um, uh, uh, um, punishment I got, I remember I was playing with my sister in my room and I broke the window, my glass window pane. And so he made me go outside, get some bricks across the street in the lot, bring them back, crush them up on newspaper, then kneel in them while I held two other rocks over my shoulders. And if I lowered my elbows below my shoulder, he threatened to hit me with this strap. That was the first punishment at 10 years old. So that can give you kind of a, a snapshot of what I was faced with for the next six years. And, um, and, and, and then I wore a Catholic uniform to a public school. So all the kids made fun of me and it was really a, an alienation that from the time I was 10 years old till I was 16, that was really humiliating. I spent a lot of time living in my head, really living in my head. And being didn't have friends that I could play with or people I could count on. It, it just, it was, I, I always kid and joke about it, but I'm very serious about it. I felt like I never went to prison because I did a long time in prison because I had already did six years in prison. Mm. And that was my mindset. Um, so um, uh, at the time I was 16, I really couldn't take it anymore. I would complain to my guidance counselor at school and I lost my door key. The guidance counselor said, listen, don't run away. If you run away, run to the youth center because if you don't, the police will get you and just bring you right back. And that was the only advice that I, I marinated on that advice for a long time. And so I lost my door key, came home one day, begged my sister to leave her key out. She left her key out my uncle came home, stepped on the mat, found the key and was waiting for me when I came to the door. And he said, listen, I want you to go get another brick from across the street. And I knew what punishment I was slated for. 
So when I went to go get the brick, I just took off and kept running. And I ran to the youth center. They called him and told him that they had me and that there was no need for him to come looking for me. And they set a court date and they brought us together a week later. And I remember um, my aunt, I'm sitting between my aunt and uncle was the most, I was 16 years old. I was scared to death. I didn't know what was going to take place. And the judge asked my uncle, he said, this child has told us about a number of different things that have taken place. And I want to know, are they true? And my uncle said, yes, your honor. I believe if a child lives in my household, he must abide by my rules and regulation. And the judge slammed the mallet down and said, I make this child a ward of the courts. I don't think my uncle was expecting that. So when the judge slams that hammer down, what do you think he was saying? He was giving a judgment about yes. his rules and regulations yes. Yes. on your uncle. What was that judgment that that judge gave to your uncle, would you say? That I was to not go back to that household. But do you feel like in some sense he was condemning your, no, I, your, your uncle's behavior or your uncle's disciplinary I, I, philosophy or something? You know, I think for me, all I saw was I'm free. <laughs> right. Mm. I, I mean, it's, it's like I could imagine this. Now, I know this is probably not an ethical topic to speak about, but I just imagined myself what a slave must have felt like when they got a chance to seek mm -hmm. freedom and nothing stopped them. That was how passionate I was about just being free, free of the stuff that I was faced with for the past six years. And that, that was, that was, that was, um, that was a good thing, but it was dangerous as well. But I only came to know that later. Yeah. Right. So I want to pick up that in a second, but mm -hmm. Your, your uncle obviously showed you plenty of discipline, but did he or your aunt give you an equal measure of love, of, you know, that unconditional love that every human spirit craves, sort of like milk? Was that any I, part of it? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. And that's something I've had a lot of time to ponder about. And, and what gives me the significant understanding about that is because um, – Love wouldn't allowed me to go off the rails later on in my life, which then I realized I was recreating the same situation in my own children's life. Why that, was that? Yeah, and that's a scary thing that, you know, I love history, and sadly, history tends to repeat itself. Most of us throughout the last several hundred or thousand years, we don't learn. You know, people will persecute others, take advantage, and, um, you know, it's, I mean, you hear about people who are raised in alcoholic homes and they become al alcoholics or they abuse their, they've been abused as a kid and they abuse their own kids. And it's, I can't imagine how you could possibly do that. I'm not a psychologist, well, but it seems but, like it's all too common. But here's why. Because truth be told, you don't know anything else and you right. only do what you know, right? So if you were raised in an environment that, those behaviors that that you were faced with are what you learn, right? So then you come and grow up and then you're faced with the same circumstances that you are. And I don't mean the behavior part of it, but a circumstance like now I'm a father and I have a family and I have to raise my family. I remember specifically using these words. Uh, well, um, my uncle used to say, I want you and I want you like you came into this world. Now that meant go upstairs, take all your clothes off because I'm getting ready to spank you. So you mm. knew when he said that, right? Yeah. When I became a father and started having children around me, I would use the same language. I want you and I want you like you came in this world. Where did that come from? Oh. I didn't like it when he was doing it to me. And you, you probably didn't even realize what you were saying in the context where it came in the heat of the moment. Out it comes. Boy, that is haunting, I guess. <laughs> it, it, it was. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I, um, when I got free from that situation, uh, I moved into another foster home that the state paid 
my friend's mother to give me a place there. And he had his nieces and nephews living there and he and his mom and her boyfriend. And all I would do was clean up and wash dishes and mop and clean because I didn't know anything else. And the kids would make fun of me. They would say, what are you, you know, I'm 16, 17 years. And all I know how to do is clean up behind people. Mm. I started getting a little looser with that. It was the 70s and things were going on in, in black communities across this country. Uh, I went and saw the movie Superfly. Hmm. Now, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I know what I want to be. Hmm. I don't have any restraints. I don't have any people saying you ought to do this, you ought to do that, right? I thought the, the utmost that a person could have is freedom, and I had plenty of it. So I went and got clothes to look like him. I went and got my hair fixed like him. I went and did all these things. Now I spend the next 20 years trying to do everything I thought he did. Now, I didn't know. I just saw a movie. A movie lasts two hours. I spent 20 years trying to live into that movie. So is that what you're talking about earlier about, you know, you crave freedom and you got it? but yet there was a side of the freedom that you didn't appreciate. What was that side that you learned later about? Freedom is a wonderful thing, but th there, was, there was something about it that didn't seem so positive. What was, well, how would you, you know, frame that? The freedom that I had caused me to be arrested all over this country. It caused me to live a lifestyle that caused me to become an alcoholic addict. Now, I was free. And the thing about freedom is usually when a person gets free, they move into a particular community and they stay in that community. Mm -hmm. And so they become accustomed to that community and all that goes on in that community. So if it's drugs and alcohol, well, you're in a community or an environment that does that. And you don't try to get out of that because everything else seems strange to you or unappreciative. You didn't mm -hmm. know that. Well, um, I did that. I did that for 20 plus years. I wind up having seven children from five different women. And then um, my uh, desire to get clean came and went, but I never could hold that down because I didn't have any focus. And then I realized one day I, I went to a treatment center that I stayed there for 90 days and then the, and that 90 days of clarity gave me something that I had not known. First of all, um, halfway through there, I met the person of Jesus Christ. Somebody asked me, don't you want a personal relationship with Jesus? Which I had no idea what that was, right? Hmm. So, all so, I know is I so, walked so, into this room. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, so you didn't really have much of a faith upbringing, either from your parents or uncle and aunt. They weren't like even religious or not church at all. going? Okay. Not at all. In fact, he said, I want you guys to go to church. And his statement was, and don't wake us up to take you. You need to make it there. Right. Okay. And so, um, so I didn't, so there was no real strong preference of that in our house. Okay. Um, it was before my mother passed away, but at nine, that just fleeted out the way. So, right. So, um, uh, and my lifestyle, certainly that didn't complement it at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I This Jesus that I knew was this kind of Jesus. Anytime I was in trouble, Lord, if you get me out of this, I won't do it again. Right? <laughs> kind of a, what they was, call a, a, a transactional relationship. Exactly. <laughs> and and I never kept up my end of the deal. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so, yeah, that's what took place. But when I got to this treatment center, um, I, I met this person called Jesus, and I was in a place, my children were scattered throughout the foster care system, my girlfriend was still using, and I had two babies by her, and and I just, like, and what I realized, and this is, this is, I think, the epiphany that I had, I had children who were growing up in the foster care system just like me. So I recreated the same thing in their life. And if I didn't like it, how could I do the same thing to them? And I think that's when the wheels started turning for me. And all I knew how to do is 
Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then help me. I, you have my undivided attention. I've recreated something in their lives that I didn't like it. And I didn't realize that my uh, disobedience has caused this. And I need you to help me get out of this. And that was all I was looking for. That was all I was looking for. So what, what was the paradigm shift? Because you're living a life where, you know, you've got a number of different relationships, different kids with different folks. I mean, there's a shift in thinking. I mean, what was the old way of thinking? And how did that shift? I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, so in my former life, after leaving uh, my aunt and uncle and, and, and turning 18 years old, I managed to graduate from high school. But after seeing the movie Superfly, all I wanted to do was be a pimp. And I lived that lifestyle very well all across this country. But, but I picked up this crack cocaine habit that, that I started um, really doing myself bad. I started um, being with women and I wasn't treating them good and I wasn't treating myself and they weren't treating me. And the lifestyle just started being really wonky, really up and down. And I got tired. I literally got tired of living. And then one of the mothers left me, my son, who was my third child. His name was Marvin. He was five years old and I didn't have any stability for him. And, and I knew that that wasn't right, right? And I tried to get in other relationships and play house and do these things, but none of that was working. And so it came to the point where if I really want to get clean, I'm going to have to set my son someplace. And I don't know any place that'll be appropriate for him, but I got to weigh this. So I sent him, I took him to his mother's house, which was not a good place at all. She lived with her grandmother, all her sisters, they all had children and he was in the mix of it. And I wasn't very well liked by that particular family, but I had to put my son somewhere. And so I went into treatment and I, I had to really deal with this thought. And, and the first thought was, I just need to get off these drugs. I just really need to refrain myself. What is it like to think clearly without being under the influence can i make some reasonable decisions so that was a turning point that this gave me an opportunity to really see life through life's lenses i still didn't know what to do i was 40 plus years old i got seven kids i don't have a trade i don't have a degree i don't have anything but i trusted the lord enough to guide me and lead me and so Three months in treatment, I got out. Um, the mother of my three, two youngest children came in as I got out. And so the courts gave me the opportunity to say, well, let, let me throw this piece in. I left one of our drug field environments with my seven month old daughter because I was mad about guys coming in and out of my house and saying, I want to see your old lady. And so I just grabbed the baby who I had been changing diapers and feeding for the seven months that she was uh, born. And I went to the hospital to leave her on the steps of the hospital. And I got to the hospital and I couldn't do it. And um, so somebody, I went to a woman's shelter and they told me, take her to the CPS office. So I did that. CPS is the Child Protection Agency. I went there. I took my daughter there and they treated me like I was public enemy number one. And they were, they were right to do so because they had been coming. I had two other children who were in custody of the CPS and they had been coming to our house, knocking on the door and we tell everybody to be quiet. And I wouldn't respond. I wouldn't. Now I'm showing up on their doorsteps and they're like, so now what do you want us to do? Right. 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 And I just, I just was determined. And I said, listen, I don't know what to do. Well, there was a lady who came out of the back and said, listen, in order for us to do this, the mother's going to have to sign off. I said, no problem. So she drove me and the baby back to our drug-filled environment. 
I told the mother, we need to sign and give this child up. I want to go get myself together. So she signed the paper reluctantly. Uh, and then the lady left with the baby. I went to say goodbye to the baby. I got locked out of the house. So instantly I became homeless. And I knew that I'm 40 plus years old. This is no way for a 40 year old man to be living. What You don't have anything to do with your life. And so uh, that was that stayed on my mind once I got into treatment. And when somebody introduced me to Christ, I'm saying, I'm here, I surrender, show me what to do. So you were sort of at the bottom of the pit, the bottom of the crucible. I mean, it sounds like before you kind of were, saw that movie, Superfly, you were maybe drifting through life, maybe life's unfair. You know, I didn't have a great life. People weren't nice to me. It's all about me. I don't know. Was there a conscious plan? Like, who cares about everybody else? Nobody else cares about me. The world's not fair. Right. It's all messed up. You know, I'm just going to enjoy myself and just get through each day as best I can. Was it like? That was my script. That was my script. It's about me. I'm going to take care of me. Nobody, everybody always said I was bad. Well, I'm going to be a bad man. Right. You know, you know what I mean? And I, I went from Hollywood to New York to Washington, D.C., to Florida, to Texas. And I, to me, for a while, that was the life. I allowed me to do pretty women, plenty of money. But that's the lure. That was the lure because it was not substantial. And it's, it's true. It's true, isn't it, Marvin, that it was about you. You just said that. You were, you were living for yourself, but you mentioned as, you're, as you were going through those years, you had several children. Yes. Um, and, and I think you even said at one point when you and I talked before this that you had brought Marvin Jr. into a crack house uh, you know, with you. So while you're living for yourself – you are creating a family. And at what point did you realize as you were coming back from your crucibles, as you were trying to come to yourself and live a more responsible life, did you, you know, what was that epiphany moment when you said, oh my gosh, I've got these kids and I have a responsibility to them. When did that happen for you? Again, when I stood in front of that hospital to leave my seven month old daughter on the steps, I realized that um, she didn't ask for this. Hmm. None of my children asked for that. And why does this seem so familiar? It's because I was left. And because I was left doesn't give me the right to leave somebody else. There has to be something different. It has to be. But what I came to the understanding was, and I think this happened in treatment, um, but if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for me. If I don't make the attempt, whatever it was, if I don't make the attempt. Um, so, so, so when I entered into this relationship with Jesus Christ, what I did was, and I didn't, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like a light, bolt of lightning came out of the sky and hit me and said, no, no. I had to work at this relationship and I didn't know anything about Jesus. I didn't know anything about the things that he does in people's life. All minds were experienced. And so here was my first experience. I got out of treatment. I knew I still loved the mother uh, who I'm married to today, but she was still using. And, 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 the, and the thought about it when you're in recovery of drugs and alcohol, they tell you, you need to leave your past behind you. Well, I found that very difficult to do. I got right. children, by how do I do that? Right. And so it, it caused me to have to lean on this person, Jesus. You have to guide me because I don't know what to do. I'm scared. I, I'm scared to death. I don't have the experience that most people have. So who do I trust? And it came down to just this. Or I had to trust Jesus for everything. Right. For everything. And, and I didn't know how to do that. I remember I would ask people, hey, man, does Jesus talk to you? I would, <laughs> I mean, people would look at me like, boy, he's crazy. But <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't, I didn't know anything to do. Um, 
I'll tell you this. Let me add this little piece here. Um, that same son that I'm talking to you about, uh, his name Marvin, he's 31 years old today. And the mother of his children passed away six months ago. And he's gotten his children. And he and I had a volatile relationship for years. And about six years ago, he came into my office and we have a Bible study in my office and he sat down. I was late that day. I walked in and he's in the middle of the Bible study and he's ranting and he's raving and he's talking loud and crazy. And I sit in the corner and I'm like, wow, there's about 25 men in this room, all different. We call this Bible study Park Benson Park Avenue because you got people who come out of the ivory towers and people who come out of prison sitting in the same room mm. together. Mm. And, uh, and then one of the brothers got up and said, here, man, here's what we do in this room. And they picked him up. My son's six, eight. I have two of them, one six, seven and one six, eight. Wow. Uh, and, um, and they sat him in the chair and the brothers got around him and laid hands and prayed for him. And he, he, he got up and he went and sat down and I saw what he did and I knew he'd been angry at me. And I, I apologize over the years because God made me understand that there was a lot of damage I did. But nothing ever happened. When I sat down in that chair that day and I began to say, man, I used to drag you from crack house to crack house. I used, I wasn't real responsible. I did all kinds of things and I'm sorry. I know I've told you this before, but I, and I think the fact that I made that amends comment to him in the room full of 25 men, it did something. It broke something because he got up, he came over to me, he got on his knees and he put his arms around my calf and he said, dad, all I ever wanted to do was make you proud of me. Oh, wow. Wasn't a dry eye in the room. Wow. Wasn't a dry eye in the room. And I'm thinking, God, only you could have done that. I've tried to do this for years, but it didn't work, but you did it. Well, I guess his, his timing. So that's powerful. It sounds like, Obviously, the big shift in your life was with faith in Christ. I mean, your faith gave you an anchor for your soul that you probably never had before. Mm. It gave you a purpose and a a reason for living that maybe you didn't have. I mean, was that well, part of the, the shift? It was. It, you're so spot on. I need to add a little bit to that story. So when I got a treatment, and we, we fought for our kids. Jeanette and I fought for our kids through the system, um, which is why we started Dads, because we had a victory. Um, mm. We had several victories. Well, here was one of the victories that gave me an, an astronomical belief in Jesus, more so till my favorite line is, you can't beat me having faith in what God will do for you. <laughs> Um, Dude. here's what happened. Um, I, I, we were just putting our house together, our family together, the children were coming home. We had to get jobs and, and, and my wife and I, and we were really trying to debate, okay, maybe you ought to stay home with the kids. And I go to work because we can't afford daycare with four kids in our house and all of that. So that worked itself out. And then one day I came home from work and the phone rang. And so I answered the phone and somebody said, is this Marvin Charles? Well, I thought it was a telemarketer. <laughs> and I said, yes. And the lady said, well, there's a lady who's been looking for you for 43 and a half years and she's your mother and she lives right down the street from you. And I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. So Jeanette just went to pick the kids up to bring them home. And so I said, this lady just called and said, my mother's been looking for me. And, and she lives right down the street. So we loaded the kids up and we went to that house. And there was this lady standing on the corner with her daughter and her niece. And it was my sister and my mother. And I just, I mean, I got out of the car and I grabbed this woman and we looked identical. And so she told me, I had you when I was 14 years old. And, I, and, and my mother had a baby who was born seven months after you. And the state wasn't going to, because my mother was on welfare, and they weren't going to take care of both of us. So they took you and put you up for adoption, right? So then the next day, I asked her about my dad. Well, where is he at? She said, well, the last time I know, he was living in Oakland. And uh, so we contacted him. I jumped on a plane to see him. Shortly after that, she jumped on a plane to see him. 
Now, mind you, when I was in treatment, the first prayer I prayed from this new relationship with Jesus Christ was, Lord, help me put my family back together again. And the amazing thing is you probably didn't know that you were adopted, right? Well, yeah, my uncle told me that I belong okay. to the state. That's what that meant. Okay, but, but, you, but you didn't know that you had a mother and... Oh, no, you know, no, I didn't know none of that. I had none of that, right? That is so, unbelievable. But let me tell you what happened, Warwick. Yeah? My mother jumped on a plane and went down to visit my dad. He asked her to marry her. She said yes. They wow. come back to Seattle. Now I have this whole family that God put together. But that, that was one powerful prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Power of prayer, but I'd like to hear a bit about dads, but I think there's a part of your story where, from what I understand, you got this um, award from uh, the Atlantic Family Center. You, yes. you put your family together, and as you put your family together, it gave you a vision of a, a mission, a ministry. So talk about how you put your family together and then how that shifted into this whole movement, this ministry that you have. Well, it's, it's, it's really, it was out of complications that really the ministry uh, came alive. Um, we, my wife and I, after putting our family together and then I went, we did Good Morning America, we did some TV overseas. And when we came back and after the dust settled, there was a real simplistic question that evolved. My wife and said, I said, there were, and during that time was a crack epidemic, epidemic and it was really strong in communities all over this country. And we felt like we had got a reprieve from it. So we said there were people that we got high with, we did time with, we did crime with, who were faced with the same situations. How could we take what we've learned from navigating the system and help other people navigate them. We literally called ourselves systems navigators. Um, and so just so that the listeners know, because not everybody might understand the story, you had like six kids, they were foster care, but you you brought all your kids together. You dealt yes. with the system, yes. got housing, got clean, got a job. So talk just a little bit about that as we shift to what you do now, because you, you were living what you now help other people. Live. So, well, that's is, true. Because that, that, that's a miracle in of itself. It can't have been easy. What you well, did. you know, see, we, we never looked at it like that. We looked at it like God gave us the ability to navigate the child welfare system, the child support system, the state system where you, they give you money to take care of your family. But at some point you have to pay that back. You know, and so we were saying, OK, how do we do that? Well, I, I tell you, this was the motivating moving factor. One day I come home from work. I got one job. It's paying for all six of us in this house to take care of this family. We got a rental property and um, and money wasn't coming very fast at all. But we were making the best of it. Now, mind you, you got to keep this in mind. I told you about the high part of life that I lived, hmm. right? When I had no cares in the world, now I got all these cares and not enough right. money to take care of it, right? right. So I, and, and because of my relationship with Jesus, I was tempted a lot of time to go and resort back to some other mindsets, of, hmm. but that wasn't, that's what God delivered me from. So hmm. why would I go back there? So how do I keep and maintain this? Well, then one day they emptied, the child support system emptied my bank account out. And I didn't know what to do. And it, I never had child support system, but my wife did. Because the children were in the foster care system, it created a debt with child support. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks don't know that, right? right? Yeah. And so she convinced them that, no, it's not my money, it's his money. But because we're married... He put my name on the bank account and I don't know how she did it, but she convinced him they put the money back. Wow. And, and then what happened was she said, do you know how many other people are suffering through this? Just this aspect of it. And so she worked with her child support uh, uh, counselor and built a very good relationship with them. So much so till literally we would on the weekends go and talk to people who were having the same problem. And I set up a little office in our house where during the week, the kids would go off to school and from 10 o'clock to two o'clock, she would literally be working with 
clients or fathers in the community who had some of those same issues. And that was part of the, the birth of, of, of dads, dads exactly. of divine alternatives for dads. So dads talk a bit about, I think we understand how it was birthed. Talk about what that does and just the important mission that you have. What, what is that? So um, our mission statement is to give fathers hope by walking together in support of community, helping navigate systems, relational and legal barriers which separate fathers from their children. And, and we really believe that once you inform a father of the opportunities that fathering or fatherhood gives them, it changes their it changes the whole mindset of a father. It changes. You know, I always say um, the greatest gift that a father can give is to prepare his children for a future that he will never see. Mm. Men get that. There's another simplistic thing that we found out over 20 years ago. Most fathers want to just be heard. And there are not opportunities system-wise where they get heard. I have an, a, a, a conference room in my office here. And that table we call the strongest table in the state of Washington <laughs> because it has all everybody's tears, everybody's mm. complaints, everybody, everything. And they get to leave it right there, right? And because of that work that we've been able to do, we found out some significant things. In low-income communities, when fathers have children, most fathers are there in the hospital when the child is born, right? And then um, I asked fathers, how many of you were there when your baby was born? And they all raised their hands. How many of you signed the birth certificate? And they all raised their hands. Well, what they don't know is they didn't sign a birth certificate. What they signed was a paternity affidavit, which is a promissory note that say, you will pay child support for this child even if you find out it's not yours, because this is a legal binding document. Now, I don't tell them not to sign it. What I say is just know what you're doing, understand. And so it's a lot of things like that, that we've, um, information we've come across in the last 22 years, and we try to share with people, don't get mad at the system. Don't get mad at the mother. These are some of the things you've done. You just took it for granted when you were doing it. It, How do sounds, I know? Because I did it. It sounds like there's two levels. There's the practical level, uh, navigating child welfare, helping them get clean, helping them get a job, helping them get housing, all of the things that you need to do mm -hmm. to get your kids back. So there's the practical, but it sounds like there's sort of the, the spiritual soul component in which, you know, people don't change unless they have a reason to. Mm. unless you can shift their thinking. So mm. I imagine some of it might be, look, you know, like you, you know, I wasn't treated fairly. Life isn't fair. The system is messed up. You know, uh, nobody cares what I think. Nobody wants to listen to me. Why should I care about anybody else when nobody cares about me? That whole thinking says that's probably not an easy, it's not easy to shift that thinking, but somehow that's a lot of the heavy lifting you do, right? Is yes, trying to yes. shift this. I mean, and some of what they say is true. Like life is unfair. There is systemic issues. There are objectively things that do make life unfair. It's not all their fault, but it's easy to, so, to just, you know, wade into all of that and just say, well, life's unfair. So why should I care? So how do, how do you shift that thinking? Cause it can't be easy. Well, it's, it, it's not easy unless you think about it through, or you see it through a different set of lenses. Let me give you an example. So um, the things that the mentality that I had to have in order to embrace this person called Jesus Christ was a significant embrace, a significant way of thinking. But then I thought about it and I said, well, Whatever the devil asked me to do, I went and did it. Hmm. I had no problem. If he said, I want you to go up in this bank with two 45s, one in each hand, I would do it. Christ, who is the preventer of me, of sin and sin in my life and living a righteous life, 
wouldn't ask me to do any of those things. So how do I find what he asked me to do more complicated than what the devil did? And I had to think and, and, and nourish my understanding on that. And that's the same thing I try to bring and preach to men that walk through my door. What, 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 what's the answer to that? Because that's a really good question. Why is it harder to do what God wants you to do? Because it was easier for me to do what the devil wants. And this okay. stuff that God wants me to do is new to me. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Being a pimp was new to me until I took the challenge of trying to do it. Right? So and give Christ the same opportunity. Right? Right. right. So that's what I had to do. And so here's, here's what I, I do this to men all the time. Here's one of my uh, trade secrets, right? <laughs> a man will come in and he'll talk to me about what the mother's doing and how come the mothers relate. And this is, uh, and I let them talk for 30 minutes. And, and I purposely let them rant and rave for 30 minutes about what the mom does. And then I stopped them and said, I thought you were here because you wanted to see your child. I do. Well, you've talked for 30 minutes and haven't mentioned the child one time. Mm. And if I was a judge, I wouldn't see anywhere in the world that you wanted to be involved in the child's life. So that's the first linchpin. You can't tell me that it's about your child, but all you're doing is talking about the mom and the unrighteousness. You're going to have to get over that. That's not going to work. And you kind of catch him at the doorway with that understanding. Is, 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 that is, is, it does. There's something about maybe all human beings, no matter what they've been through, when they have a son or a daughter, when you say, you know, you've got a responsibility to care for them, they feel like there's something, maybe a God-given anchor, a thread, something that you can build on that it, it catches. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because most of them will resort back to the thinking, not initially, but they will resort back to the thinking, I don't want my child to grow up like I grew up. I want to give my child a better life, a better opportunity than I had. And because of the significant turn of events in their life, they, they get away from that. Mm -hmm. It's like being on an island, they get away from that thinking. And I said, no, I'm a perfect example. If you just, so what we say to men is just go get yourself together. And you know why? Because one day your child is going to knock on your door and what are you going to tell them? You know what they're going to say? If you're not together, they're going to say, well, you're just like what mom said you were. Mm. And that, that is a powerful motivator, isn't it? Yes. You know? yes. And just, and the vision, I'm sure that, you know, of your son, you know, you'd apologize, but the power of when an apology is accepted, when you've been forgiven, Yes. I mean, that, that moment I'm sure you share, because I talk about, you know, vulnerability for a purpose. Yes. That story probably helped a lot of other guys. Like, yes. you can have that moment with your son and your yes. daughter. Yes. And that's something that you probably treasure forever. I do. You know, in, in it, your heart. It's crazy because they treasure it just as much. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what dads try to say is, you're sitting here complaining about not being in your son, but what most men won't do is think and I mean, think that their child is somewhere missing them just as much. You know, it is interesting. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, sin can be passed down through seven generations, which basically Ooh. means forever. It's sort of a metaphor. But yet, you know, virtue can have the same effect. Amen. And, you know, obviously, as we talked about our fair, I grew up in about as different a background as you did. Uh, I mean, very, very different background. But one of the things I remember is the fellow that started the family media business, he was as strong uh, a man of, of, of Christ as you could possibly get. Mm. He was an elder at his church. Uh, this is like in the early 1840s. He came out from England with, with nothing. He uh, was a very good husband, very good dad. His employees loved him when he died. His employees said, we've lost a kind and valued em employer. So he... Mm. Yeah, every aspect of his life was in balance. He was successful, but yet he had an incredible relationship with his kids, mm. uh, as I say, elder at his church and, and, and with his wife. Well, that faith lasted several generations as mm. the family became more successful, became a little mm. bit more traditional, a little mm. less Christ-centered. But that, that positive legacy has lasted for generations. I'm the fifth generation. Mm. And the impact you talk about, 
you know, how, you know, you're, there might be people that you, know, you have an effect on that you don't know. Well, that's my great, great grandfather. Mm. Very few people will know their great, great grandkids. It's yes. almost technically yeah. impossible unless you live to 150. <laughs> yes. Yet that positive aspect and the effect that, you know, his had on my, on my life, my dad was a little bit more ecumenical, good guy, but a little bit sort of intellectual, not quite mm. the same face sadness. But that influence that he's had on my life, John Fairfax, my great, great grandfather, it's hard to quantify it. So that's a, that's a touchstone, that's a legacy. Well, the people that you work with, they have a chance to affect five generations in their family, kids that they'll never know. That's a blessing that can maybe not last forever, but last for a long time. You know? I, 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 would, I would challenge you to say forever. Yes. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Because, because uh, children nowadays are equipped or have access to equip themselves on their own, mm -hmm. right? Well, I'm a prime example of what that will do. So I don't want my seven, I had another daughter at 54, so I'm 65 years old. So I just need you to know that, right? <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the difference is she was ro raised up, she's being raised up in a two-parent home right. and all she, she has no idea about the other part of it. Her siblings come to her and said, you don't know how good you have it. Right. <laughs> right? You've got it so good. You, you're yeah, right. Right. <laughs> but, but like you said, she has a relationship. We've sent her to Christian's private school and we tell her, we do not hide from it. This is where we came from. This is what we do. And our communication level is so open. She has a, a group of friends that she's closely connected to. And I look at what I've learned from her and being raised in and her being raised in that environment, right? So yes, I do see the impact that I could have on my youngest child's life for generations. And, and what I love about what you said, I'm sure this is part of what you do in dads, is like change, obviously from your perspective, from mine, have a, a you know, focus in faith, uh, Christ centeredness. Um, but you know, at age appropriate levels, don't hide who you were, right. don't hide the pain. Because again, you know, my case is very different, but my dad was married three times, my mother twice. Fortunately, I was from the last marriage of each, mm -hmm. but I've seen the devastation that divorce can have even mm. in wealthy affluent families, mm. you know, in some cases, you know, maybe lack of parents being around, lack of love, you know, nannies raising kids, which is, is not very healthy. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of paranoid a bit about divorce. I was very careful, wanted to make sure my wife, mm. who we've been fortunately married uh, over 30 years, mm. to have somebody of character who loved the Lord. And I've told that to my kids. You know, you got to be careful. Make sure, from my perspective, that your wife or husband has a strong faith and character. Well, those I don't hide from my kids. You don't want to be like my dad or mom in the mm. sense of all the, the marriage. You don't want to be like that. So, mm -hmm. so at age appropriate levels, the, the challenges we've been through can help our kids, help our grandkids, you know? Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, I'm uh, sharing with you that my son, who now has his two children, is not married, but he has a young lady friend, and, and they, they, they've agreed to parent these two children and I, and, I, and, I, and I had to go to her job, my wife and I, and tell her how much we appreciate her, right? And she said to me, I'll never forget this. She said, you know, anytime a, a, a guy friend that I've been with, parents shows up, it's usually to tell me to leave their son alone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, that's the least of my worry. I want you to know that we're there, here to support you because just to be with him and be willing to take on this responsibility, we know it's not an easy one. Um, I really wanted to tell her, I wish you guys would get married, but I felt like I would way out of place with saying that, but that's right. my prayer. Sure. That's my prayer. And if you're willing to put that time and energy in, then that's warranted. And so I just, I just, um, I see something taking place in the lives of these two grandchildren of mine. It's amazing the power of um, of unconditional love and support. It's sort of like um, 
I don't know, uh, a spring in, in, uh, in a dry land. You know, if, if, a, yes. if, a, if Planck gets yeah. a little bit of unconditional love, it's like it can change people. Yes. You know, yes. and that's it what can. you do with the guys you work with and, you know, uh, the girlfriends, wives of the guys you work with. I mean, it has an impact. I'm yes, sure. it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. We, we work, we've seen over pretty close to 5,000 men in the last 20 years that we've been in existence. Um, and it's, it, it has um, a major impact on the lives of the children that are connected to these families. Yeah. Right. And that is a, uh, a term a perspective that we talk a lot about, Marvin, at Crucible Leadership and Beyond the Crucible, the idea of the legacy that you leave. Um, and certainly your life of significance, your legacy is in the lives of those 5,000 men. Mm -hmm. As we get to the point now where we're you know, going to bring the plane in for a landing, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to have you unpack a quote that I've seen you give um, because we've been talking a lot about, you've talked a lot about your personal experience um, with struggling with your own fatherhood and then embracing your fatherhood. We've talked about the way you've helped other other men do that work, talked a little bit about his situation. But backing up to a 30,000 foot level, you said something, and I want you to explain this to our listeners. Um, you've, you've said that fatherlessness is like AIDS to society. Mm -hmm. Explain what you mean by that, because I think it's a powerful metaphor for what the lack of involved fathers does in society. So, uh, so I'll talk about <laughs> the disease and then I'll talk about the cure. Right. Okay. All right. So um, I, I've often said that fatherlessness is like the AIDS virus. If you know anything about AIDS, AIDS doesn't kill you. What it does, it breaks down your immune system and the infection that you catch is what kills you. Well, fatherlessness is the same way. If you take a father out of the home, the family doesn't die, but what it does is open the mm. family up for infection. Teenage right. mm. pregnancy, at risk youth behavior, all of those things that has impacted the society in which we live in. And so what we believe in dads is one of the cures is how do we re-engage the father back into the lives of the children? And in some cases, maybe even the family. But I think that what, what we try to do is draw the attention to the father, how important his life is to the children that he's fathered. And I think that there's a not enough understanding for men to understand the value that they are to their children. Number one is we, and, and I'm, a, I'm guilty of this and most people in the world are, is we never listen to children. And, and my wife showed me a, a, a prime example one day in our office. Um, there was this father and this mother who had a five-year-old son and my wife had the mother in her office and I had the father in my office. And the child kept running back saying, mommy, look at this, mommy, look at this. And then he'd run to the dad in my office and say, daddy, look at this, look at mm -hmm. this. And the, that child showed the mother and the father, which Jeanette and I pointing it out, the importance that both of them were to him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when adults make those decisions, they don't look at the importance of the father and the mother to that child's life. They only see their own importance. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's how I think if we can get people to understand the importance that both of them are to that child's life, it could change wow. the matter. That's wonderful. As we kind of begin to sum up here, I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure, in the Seattle area and beyond, look at what you do with dads, divine alternatives for dad services, and say, well, Marvin, this is like a miracle. You're changing families' lives father's lives. Wow. I mean, how do you do it? I mean, it's, it's obviously, you know, the Lord has his hand on everything you do, but what's, what would you say in summary is some of the keys of why what you do makes such a massive difference? Um, th there's a scripture that I came upon 
in my early days of recovery, um, this preacher, when I wasn't familiar with the Bible or where to go, he said, just go to Psalms 119 and read that every day. That's 175 verses that I read every day. <laughs> right. And I read them. Well, then there was two that jumped out at me that I think described it to the T for me. And uh, Psalms 119, the 67 verse says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. And I, 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 I could see myself in that scripture going astray. And then a couple of verses down from that is the 71st verse. And the 71st verse says, it was good for me that I was afflicted or I might not have sought your way. Mm. And I said, that's me all the way. That is me. And I want folks to know that I believe that I could never get right enough with Christ to where I could make a difference in anybody's life. But when he pointed me to those scriptures, I realized that I had to... to that the ground was level at the foot of the cross, that I had just as much of an opportunity as anybody else. And I use those scriptures to let people know that you have the same opportunity. It's about what you want to do, though. Mm. You can't blame that on anybody else. You have to make a choice. Nobody can stop you. And that's that's been the meat of my sermon. I have been involved in the communications business long enough and I've been a Christian long enough to know when the last word in a conversation is spoken, and you just spoke it, Marvin. <laughs> um, before we go, though, before I close, I want to give you the chance so our listeners can know more about dads. How can they find dads on the internet? Where can they go to learn more about your organization? So our web address is www.aboutdads.org. Again, About? that's www.aboutdads.org aboutdads.org. Excellent. Warwick, any final thoughts before I close? Well, only it's just remarkable what I hear Marvin uh, talk about the work you're doing with dads. And, you know, you give do all the practical things, which are really necessary in terms of helping dads get clean, um, who have substance abuse issues, uh, housing, you know, negotiating with the whole child welfare system. But you know, nobody changes without a reason. You give them a reason, a faith mm. underpinning from your perspective mm. and mine, a, a faith in Christ. Mm. You, you help them realize that, you know, they are fathers and that has a, you know, spiritual, eternal uh, significance, uh, you know, legacy significance. You give them a reason to change. Nobody changes without a reason. And it's, even then it's, it's hard. So, it seems like that the spiritual anchor, the underpinning is transforming lives. And as you say, what's exciting, it's transforming lives of maybe grandkids, great, great grandkids that might never know, mm. but, they, but they will hear the stories of lives being changed and their great, great grandfather or whoever it was that, you know, led the start of, of a shift in their family. I mean, that's an amazing vision, amazing legacy that you have in so many people's lives. Mm. And, well, thank you. And that ding that you heard, listener, is the captain turning on the, the uh, uh, landing gears uh, that sign that says it's time to land. So we're landing the plane <laughs> at, this, uh, at this moment. Um, as I like to do at the end of, of episodes, sometimes I'll pull some key takeaways, three key takeaways. There was one moment here. I'm just going to go with one key takeaway from our conversation with Marvin Charles. And there was something that, that Marvin said when he was talking about going through his crucible and how he, on the other side of that crucible, he and his wife took what they learned going through their crucible and applied it to help others. And he used this phrase uh, about he had a, they had a victory. They had a victory over their own crucible. And from that, they've applied it to the creation of dad. So I think the takeaway on that point is your victory, regardless of what your crucible is, your victory in overcoming your crucible can be and often is the jumping off point for your life of significance. The lessons you learned and applied and the actions you've taken in, move, in moving beyond the failures, setbacks, and missteps of your life can be offered to help others to do the same thing. 
with their failures, their setbacks, and their missteps. Out of your pain can be birthed your purpose. Mm. That's what we've just talked about for the last hour with Marvin Charles. Until we are together next time, listener, thank you for spending time with us. Um, and uh, Warwick and I have a little favor to ask you. Uh, on the app that you're listening to this podcast right now, we'd ask that you click uh, subscribe. That will ensure that you'll never miss an episode. And it will also ensure that we're able to get really, truly, we hope, hopeful and helpful content like our conversation with Marvin into uh, the, uh, the smartphones and the computer desktops of more people. Um, and again, until the next time that we are together, please remember that your crucible experience is painful. We know that. Uh, all three of us have been through crucibles of our own. Mm. But here's the good news. That crucible experience that you're going through or maybe you're, on, you're, you're starting to come out of is not the end of your story. In fact, as it was for Marvin, it can be the beginning of an entirely new story, an entirely more fulfilling story, an entirely life-changing story for you and for others. Because where that story takes you as you begin to write it, as you learn the lessons of your crucible and walk through them, that journey can take you to a, a totally different destination. And that is a life of significance. <laughs>